Well, good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Um, I need to ask in advance here for just a, uh, just a Sunday of some grace. The Harrington Five have officially moved into the house next door. Um, now, for now, what that means is we will be wearing mismatched clothing and living out of boxes for a while. So, a little bit of grace, please. If you see us wearing clothes that don't fit or have food stains, whatever it is, a little bit of grace. Anyway, we have been in a series we started a few weeks back called White Space, where we're simply talking about the fact that we live in a culture where there is an epidemic of hurriedness and busyness and, and, and a, a, an epidemic of our value being assigned by how much we can produce. And so we're aiming to kind of, to kind of reset and to not be slaves to that and to instead make as our core verse, Matthew 6.33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added as the screen magically goes up. <laughs> At least we know it works, right? We've been trying to use that verse to basically say, look, we need to take those things that are kingdom transformational first. Let's do those things first and make sure they're happening first. And then all the other stuff that busies us and hurries us, let's add those in after we've made the important things the important things, all right? So that's where we've been for the past couple of weeks and where we'll keep spending time. We're going to take these subsequent weeks and looking at some of those transformational components that we need to make sure are present in our lives before we busy ourselves up with all the other stuff, all right? And so today, we're going to talk about a big one, a crucial thing that we need to make sure that we have white space for in our lives. It's the word discipleship. I'm going to be honest, it's a kind of a churchy word meaning it's a word that you don't really ever hear anywhere except in churches. But it's really the only way to say it because it's simply about making disciples. And so not only is it a churchy word, but it's also unfortunately a commonly misunderstood and underapplied term in the lives of many Christ followers today. It's one of those words that we, we kind of have to go back and, and relearn, kind of take a, a 101 course in what it really means. Um, I look over at Mike's drum set here, and I'm, I'm a drummer. I'm kind of a closet drummer. I've, I've drummed for a long time, and I always enjoy playing drums. But um, I remember back in a band that I was in, uh, late high school, early college, um, we thought we were going places, by the way. We weren't. We were horrible, but we thought we were going places. <laughs> now, we had this drummer that could do all sorts of flashy work with his hands, and he had years of experience in traveling marching bands and drum corps and all this stuff. But he had some serious struggles with some of the most basic drumming concepts that were kind of essential components to play rock and pop music. Now, let's just say there was a little bit of tension in the band because this poor drummer had the worst situation. He had the frontman guitarist for his band was also a drummer and was a musical perfectionist. And he made life pretty tough for this poor drummer. In fact, this arrogant, self-important frontman ended up having to go back to all that drummer's tracks when they went to the studio and correct all of his mistakes. That poor drummer was not me. I was the arrogant front man. And uh, it was true. He, so I was going to go over and illustrate, but I don't think I could fit back there without injuring myself. So um, there's, there's a straight, his biggest thing was this. There's a straight beat that you can play. Mike played several this morning. Some people call him a four on the floor beat. A nice straight four, four beat like this. And he would come around to go to do a big cymbal crash and he'd crash the cymbal, but he wouldn't hit the kick drum when he'd hit the cymbal, which is like the first thing you learn with drums. It sounds like somebody dropped a trash can lid. You, got, you two have to go together. It was drumming 101 and it got me so frustrated. Well, Jesus kind of did the same thing with his own disciples. He wanted to make sure that they grabbed a hold of their mission loud and clear. And so he went back to the basics and he started with our primary purpose and objective as followers of Jesus. Look at this well-known passage here in Matthew 28. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He says, I'm in charge, okay? Therefore, and he goes, here's your job description, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I'm with you always, even to the end, the very end of the age. And so Jesus, before he leaves earth, he gathers all of his disciples and essentially tells them, these are drums, this is a straight four on the floor, and when you come around the toms after a fill and you hit the cymbal, always hit the kick. He says, this is your primary focus. 
Here is what I want you to do. I want you to take the life that I produced, that I multiplied in you, and I want you to multiply it in others. He uses the phrase, make disciples. That's the commission given to us. That is what Jesus' last word to his disciples were. That's the core for Jesus. But sometimes, (laughs) excuse me, sometimes we misunderstand this mission. Sometimes we muddle it up into something that's a lot less demanding. Sometimes we side this primary purpose into something safe and easy, where discipleship somehow just becomes gathering with other Christians. Maybe we think it happens by osmosis or something, that that God's heart to reach the lost and disconnected and hurting somehow seeps out of these church windows while we sing, beckoning to our neighbors to repent and be baptized, or that it somehow happens on its own when we wear a Christian t-shirt or tell someone about that one song we like on K-Love. It's so much more than that, and it's something that we must make white space for in our lives. We can't miss this. It's about pouring our lives into broken and hurting people. It's about real and meaningful relationships and seeing Christ do His work to grow people there. You see, disciple is basically a word that means learner. And discipleship is a process by which someone comes to know Jesus and is guided to grow in Him. Again, it's relationally based. Jesus didn't meet his 12 disciples and hand them some books on tape. It was relationship based. And furthermore, discipleship starts with another word that some people cringe at. Evangelism. Evangelism can be another one of those weird words. Check out some, uh, some YouTube wormholes sometime. You'll find all sorts of videographical evidence of some very interesting characters and their definition of evangelism and disciple making, right? There's all sorts of strange street corner stuff out there. But let me distill it for us this morning this way. I'm going to say it nice and slow. We must have white space in our lives to invest relationally in those who need to know Jesus. That's this morning's sermon condensed into one sentence right there. It has to be rooted in authentic, meaningful relationships. <clears throat> Think about that dynamic. Is it ever a comfortable exchange when that person floating around the mall kiosk wanders towards you with a pamphlet in their hand and that I'm going hunting look in their eyes? Does that ever end up well? Is it ever comfortable? Or, or the well-meaning guy in the, uh, in the suit outside the beach resort handing out mini King James Bibles and, and an Are You Going to Heaven tract? Is that ever a comfortable engagement? Now, I'm not saying that those things have never yielded any results, but seriously, have you ever had a complete stranger try to sell you something substantial that would change your life? How did it feel? <laughs> Debbie and I, before kids, uh, we fell for one of those too-good-to-be-true timeshare trips. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I think this was for some condo in the Smoky Mountains. We had to listen to a sales pitch, but we got, you know, three days, two nights in some lodge with a hot tub or something. We knew it was coming. We scheduled the pitch early on to get it out of the way. So it was several hours at this little table with an older southern guy who looked like he frequented tanning beds, with slicked back gray hair and lots of breath mints, teeth whitener, and brute cologne. That's the setup for you, all right? He was a close talker, too. Lots of fake smiles. Now, his job was to try to set us up for an imaginary paradise vacation and then show us a timeshare that was in that location and move in for the hard sell. That was his job. It took forever. I mean, he, kept try- he was trying all of his tricks on, on Debbie and I. Where is your dream vacation? Myrtle Beach? Orlando? How about Branson, Missouri? Branson, Missouri? I told him, so my answer to that, my dream vacation, I said, camping with an old Airstream trailer in the canyon lands of Arizona and Utah. He couldn't find that on his list. <laughs> so he ended up using this, this imaginary getaway to Disney in Orlando as his default example. I had worked in travel booking Disney trips. I had seen behind the curtain of that all-powerful mouse. No no disrespect to any of you Disney lovers out there, but that salesman made the wrong choice, okay? (laughs) He could see he wasn't getting anywhere. He started into the, what do you do for a living? And what makes you tick kind of conversation to to, to try to get us on the same page and find some common ground. Well, 
I had just taken a position as a youth pastor at this point, helping out a church in Georgia. Uh, His response to that to try to find common ground was this line. I come from a long line of churchgoers. What does that even mean? (laughs) Debbie and I were getting increasingly tired and disgusted. Uh, Poor Debbie, my engineering-minded wife, her her logical and analytical brain had, had about had enough. And when he finally dramatically set his papers down and asked us, Don't you think God wants you to be happy? I think smoke started coming out of her ears. Her eyes turned red and her head spun around on her neck. It was miserable. We finally got out. Once he accepted that he had been turned down, the smile disappeared. The handshake stopped. So somehow along the line, we got the idea that that was the first step in how to make disciples? An uncomfortable hard sell? See, evangelism as a confrontational cell without a relationship that doesn't give it any credibility or context, that's not how it's meant to operate. But some of us grew up thinking that that was evangelism, that we needed to work up the guts to walk up to strangers and blurt out John 3.16 and Romans 3.23, and for that reason, it felt too extreme, too socially difficult, too something. So we figured we're just going to take an F in the evangelism class and hope for better in the other other subjects. But the good news is that evangelism and discipleship are meant to be about relationships, just like they were with Jesus' disciples. But here's kind of a catch, and it's kind of a big one. In order to relationally invest and reach out to people that need to know the life-changing love and grace of Jesus, we need to first be disciples. (laughs) We need to first be entirely convinced that his life and his way is better. We have to be disciples first ourselves. We need to have discovered his love and mercy and found his abundant life to be so much better than what we knew before. That's what makes us want to share with anyone who doesn't have it. The Bible tells us that God's Holy Spirit is a comforter, a joiner, a healer. And Jesus himself joins with us in our sorrows and our struggles and our suffering and tells us, fear not for I am with you. That's life-changing stuff to share with someone who is hurting, right? But too often, we do what Christians have inadvertently been doing for a long, long time. We retreat to the comfort of the church walls. It's what we know. It's where we're comfortable. Except look what famous uh, 1800s British missionary C.T. Studd writes. He says, Some live within the sound of a chapel bell. I want to run a mission a yard from the gates of hell. I remember, um, it was summer of 2001. I was a youth pastor here. Um, Debbie and I were still learning about boundaries in life and how much time to give to your workplace because when you, when you don't have kids and you live right there, you can just keep, keep putting in the time. And it was exciting time. It, it was a lot of, a lot of energy was, was invested over here. But what we, we got to a place that summer where we realized that we had busied ourselves with so much good church work that we had left no room in our lives to intersect with those far from God. It was a Friday night, I think. Uh, I remember those were the days back where we could both get home from work and say, so what do you want to do tonight? (laughs) I remember those days. Anyway, we headed out and decided to go to the Andy Warhol Museum, kind of the alternative crazies that hung out there because kind of that's what we remembered from college. That's who we were. So we headed out to reintroduce ourselves to the world outside of church walls. That may seem kind of strange to some of you, but kind of that's what it took. I'm looking around and I'm saying, Yeah, I I had friends that looked like that in college. Hey, these are my people. It's been a long time. (laughs) But we needed to have kind kind of a check valve released. Little did I know that this was maybe a small seed that God was planting to prepare me to take the very difficult step a few years later, leaving these safe and wonderful church walls to help start a new church that aggressively sought from the start to reach the unchurched. If you call yourself a follower of Jesus, it should cause you to ask yourself what you are actively doing to influence other people for Christ. I say actively because maybe you remember that phrase from last week, that our tendency over time is to become less like Jesus. If we are not actively pursuing our mission of evangelism and discipleship, we become just like the millions of church attenders in this country 
that have turned Christianity into an inwardly focused group of well-intentioned but self-serving consumers. This, um, this North Hills Christian Church body of believers, I, I dearly love this church. I am excited for this church. We are in, we're at an incredible location here. We're comprised of some fantastic leaders and servant-hearted people who have sustained this church from its humble roots in 1960 when founding members took second mortgages on their home and they shook up the comfort of their lives to bring a church into this neighborhood. This church was a key part of my own early discipleship process of encouraging and equipping and challenging me. And it's why I believe God began to stir my heart again this past calendar year, calling me from my 15 years of comfort and stability at Discovery Christian Church up in Cranberry and telling me to go yet again to help partner with this church and to watch God continue to do great things. I even remember the night that I finished composing my letter to church leadership where I, I kind of went off script from the usual cover letter proprieties and formalities where you, you have all these official things you're supposed to say. And I signed off my letter with a heartfelt phrase, and it said this. I went back and looked at it. I said to the leadership, I want to partner with North Hills Christian Church to challenge and deepen the spiritual lives of the faithful, to offer healing and hope to the wounded and dechurched." to unfold the arms of the unconvinced, and to make it hard for people in the surrounding North Hills neighborhoods to go to hell. That's honestly how I closed my letter. That's my heart. Look in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1-8. These are the last recorded words out of Jesus' mouth here on planet Earth. He says, Be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. His last words before going into heaven were to spread the news, to go and share what you know about him, to be his witnesses, Jerusalem and Samaria. Those, by the way, were the immediate and adjacent regions. In our context, that means our neighborhoods, our communities. He never ordered the disciples to isolate themselves from the rest of culture to make sure they remained separate from the world. He told them to go and make disciples, to share with others his message so that they too can share in his grace and his better way to do life. He gave us that charge. So if you're already a disciple, then where you are and who you do life with, that's your mission field. Jesus' charge to go is not just so financially stable, churched white people can write checks to third world countries, to missionaries serving there. It's about upsetting each and every one of our apple carts with the radical, life-changing love and mission of Jesus. I'm just going to pause for a minute for pastor confession here. This can be difficult for a pastor. My vocation, the way I spend a solid 50 plus hours of my week, is working for a church. Generally speaking, my workplace is already occupied by Christ followers, right? Generally, though, the way it works, when you're a pastor, you're at some kind of community gathering or a social event, you're talking to people in adjacent seats on a plane, whatever it is, and as soon as somebody asks what you do and you have to breathe deep and say, pastor, you're like the wet blanket on the conversation because that point on, everything's neutered. The conversation gets real boring real fast. They feel like they have to censor their life content story and it just makes for some empty conversation. That can be difficult, but it forces me to have to be more deliberate with how I can be in my community, my neighborhood, and I'm looking forward to doing that now that we're kind of, sort of, moved in over here, which is, well, in the parking lot of a church. Can't seem to get away from the whole church thing, but it's, it's a challenge, and it needs to happen. But here's the deal. It's not just pastors that Jesus commanded to make disciples, It's not just the gifted communicators or the church leaders or the mature followers. It's every single one of us that call ourselves a follower of Jesus. It's not about how smooth of a talker you are. It's not about how perfectly you answer theological questions. You can stumble over your words all day long and God can still be glorified. He simply calls you to invest in people. I don't agree with uh, John Piper on everything, but I do like what he says about this. He said this line, I like your awkward way of doing it better than others' way of not doing it. Okay? We have a purpose. Do you remember, do you remember the London Transit Authority story that I told a few weeks back? The bus story? The bus released, they, they put out a press release saying we can't keep stopping for passengers. We want to meet our timetable. Isn't that what the bus is for? 
We have a purpose. We can't forget that purpose. We exist as a church to help people discover Jesus. That is our purpose, and everything we do should be born out of that. We are to be searching for those who are lost. That's the church. But we also have that purpose individually. That's what we need to make the white space for. We're going to spend the rest of our time this morning in Matthew 5. It's Jesus explaining just what that individual purpose is. Matthew 5.13. Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. So Jesus says we're to be like salt. What's he talking about? Well, to start off, salt has a lot of different functions that we could list off. We could say salt's valuable. Um, It was a valuable commodity in Jesus' time. We get our word salary from the word salarium, a pay of salt for entry-level Roman soldiers. Wars were fought over salt. You can ask Mike about the Union versus Confederate battles of Saltville. Not kidding. They were small, but they fought over salt. It did happen. Um, Salt adds flavor. That's why Jesus said, I came so you could have life and have it more abundantly. Have you ever been to... One of those churches where everyone looks like they're sitting in a 10-hour shareholders meeting about company losses, like they're angry and constipated or something. Have you ever ever been to that church? Sometimes I just want to say, if Jesus is in your heart, then please let your face know. We need to add some flavor to the world. Salt adds flavor. Salt preserves. When Jesus spoke these words, he was no doubt surrounded by fishermen in the audience. For them, salt was their livelihood. It was a preservative. They they catch a fish, you gut it, you pack it in two layers of salt to keep it from spoiling and decaying, to keep it fresh, to preserve it. But here's the catch. See what I did there? Ah, Okay. The catch for salt to preserve something, it actually has to come in contact with it. Like like Jesus said to love your neighbor, but a recent Gallup poll indicates that 72% of Americans don't even know their next door neighbors by their first and last name. We have to get close to people to be a preservative, to share Jesus. Um, Salt creates thirst. In just about every bar in Pittsburgh, there's bowls of salted peanuts or pretzels free for the taking because salty snacks makes you thirsty and you buy more drinks. That's the idea. As the old salesman phrase goes, your job is not to make them drink. It is to make them thirsty. Is your life making people thirsty for Jesus? When people look at your life, do they say, I'll have what he's having? Do they even notice a difference? Now, maybe you've heard some of those salt references before, but I want to land on a big one this morning, and it has everything to do with context. Remember we talked about that last week, about what was the author intending to communicate to their audience? Jesus was talking to a largely agricultural culture. That's who his audience was. That's just widespread historical fact. So I think we can pretty safely say when when he says we're the salt of the earth, he's not talking about a shaker of table salt. So what's he talking about? Well, I'm glad you asked because the application for us is huge. You see, Jesus isn't really talking about household salt, but it's agricultural uses. The salts in Jesus' day were mixtures of chlorides of sodium, magnesium, and potassium with very small amounts of calcium sulfate, which is gypsum. Some of these would dissolve more quickly than others. Some were better able to withstand the elements. These harder, or hardier and saltier salts were generally more valuable in an agricultural context because that meant their benefits would last longer. And do you know what their primary use was? Fertilizer. Fertilizer. Salt has been a method of fertilizing soil for centuries. And so when Jesus talked about the salt losing its saltiness, that's the process in which those compounds in the raw salts would naturally disintegrate over time. Disintegrated salt loses a little bit of gypsum, which changes its saltiness. And this change makes it a less effective fertilizing agent. So when Jesus talked to his followers about losing their saltiness, he's talking about losing their fertilizing properties, their ability to bring about life and growth. Starting to make sense. Jesus says we're the salt of the earth. The word used for earth is more often translated in Scripture as soil. So if we are salt in the agricultural sense, we are the salt in the soil. We are supposed to get messy and go to where nothing is growing. To go be a catalyst for life in the barren places. We need to be scattered where the soil most needs to be fertilized. 
We need to be in close relationships with people who do not know or believe the gospel so that new life in Christ might grow where there is now only barren wasteland. I want to close with the two verses that follow the salt passages in Matthew 5. Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. I can just picture Jesus on the side of the mountain by the sea, the Sea of Galilee, just gesturing to the city up on the hill on the horizon while he's talking. They knew what he was talking about. You can't hide it. It's right there. Light dispels darkness. Light illuminates the truth. It brings things out of the shadows. Something I'm not going to miss about the house we just moved out of. Our bedroom, the bed was over pretty close to some closet doors. And there were those closet doors where there's two of them that are bifold that kind of pull out. And then they you know, create the, the folded out sides. And they were painted like a dark brown black color. So in the middle of the night, I'd get out of the bed and I'm right there by the closets. And if Debbie or I had left one of our closets open, it was a face first right into the door. When you're just getting up and you're groggy and you've got to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, that's not a fun way to be greeted. Not going to miss that. But a little bit of light can go a long way to just help you see those shadows, to see those corners. That's what light does. And we are light. Look at this room. Last Sunday, we had about 170 or so people in this church in these seats. That's 170 potential lights. Many of these lights are burning brightly. But listen, a light burning brightly doesn't serve its main purpose here on Sunday mornings. It serves its purpose out there during the week. Shining truth and goodness and hope into the darkness and shadows. The salt illustration, the light illustration. Jesus is communicating the same thing to us. Jesus asks us to be that kind of light. To be that kind of salt. To go and invest our lives in relationships where there is hurting and barrenness and darkness and brokenness. He wants us to have his heart and his compassion. So many of us in the world today, we struggle with the temptation to become indifferent because it's everywhere. It happens outside the church. It happens inside the church. We've lost compassion. We've lost concern for the welfare of other people. I don't know if anybody remembers this. There was a story in Hartford, Connecticut about nine or ten years ago. Um, It made national news. There was an elderly man trying to cross a, a busy town street after getting some groceries, and there were cars racing. One of the cars hit him. He was badly injured and bleeding in the road. Surveillance video shows nine cars passed him, including several had to swerve to drive around him, and many, many pedestrians walked by him or even kind of stepped over top of him to continue on with what they were doing. It took a police officer who was on call for something else who happened to see him who finally called an ambulance. And that, that created an uproar about, can we, can we arrest people or find people for not doing something to help someone who's hurting? And there's not really any way to pin that on someone. I want you to know that apathy and indifference might not be illegal, but it is the opposite of Jesus. The love of God should compel us to be in search of those who are hurting and lost. Whether that's in your break room at work or your neighbor's yard. Whether it's at a little league game or at the family reunion. Sharing dinner in your home with that unsavory couple down the street. Or on your knees crying with a neighbor in their living room at their loss. Going out to drink with a single dad whose wife just left him. Opening your home to a foster child. Any ways that you can clear white space in your busy life. To invest in hurting and broken and barren lives. That's what Jesus did. Jesus told us when he was beginning his ministry that he was the light of the world. And when he's concluding his ministry and preparing to leave earth, he says to his followers, to his church, you are the light of the world. It's like he passes the torch on to us. We are to be reflections of his light and cultivators of his life and healing. And this is why you've been hearing a lot over recent months about simplifying some things here at North Hills Christian Church, about what things we do and don't do, or why we do the things we do. I hope the message this morning helps bring some of that into focus. Our byline here at North Hills Christian Church is connect, grow, serve. We must put forefront our call to connect with the lost and broken and messy. 
It's the entire reason that we can do things. It's why every kind of event that we, that we put out there to be able to do is something you can and should invite friends to. That's the point. It's not one of those things you have to say, hey, uh, Ethan, that thing that's coming up, can I invite a friend? Yes, always. Sunday morning, always. That's what we're, that's what we're here for. But know this. It was never our job to single-handedly point people to salvation. Our job is to fertilize the barren soil, to plant seeds, to shine light and care about people. God is the one that changes hearts. So this morning, which illustration is more true about you? Fertilizer in barren land? Or do you think maybe more like the passers-by on Park Street in Hartford for the hit-and-run accident? I hope you hear the urgency in my words this morning, and I pray you will always be inviting people to this church and into your life, sharing your life with messy people. I hope you will increasingly understand our purpose as a church, but more importantly even, your purpose as a follower of Jesus. I pray regularly that that God will not allow this church to just become a home for the already convinced. And my heart still burns for how I closed my letter that I shared earlier, to challenge and deepen the spiritual lives of the faithful, to offer healing and hope to the wounded and dechurched, to unfold the arms of the unconvinced and make it hard for people in the surrounding North Hills neighborhoods to go to hell. Can we pray? God, we love you. God, I love this church. You love this church. You love the people in this church far greater than our human love can even understand. But God, you also love this community. You love these neighborhoods. You love the people that are difficult for us to love. God, give us your eyes. Give us your heart. And God, light the fire in us to be urgent, to feel the urgency of seeking and connecting with those who are hurting, who are lost. God, to be able to go and be fertilizer to, to, the, to the barren soil, to go where things aren't growing. God, that is difficult. That is a challenge, and that can be uncomfortable. God, give us that commitment. Help us to step out in that way as people, as a church. We give it all to you, God, because you're the one that changes lives. We just want to be obedient. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going we're gonna to...